Hello and welcome. This is Lita Downs from the Center for Faculty Excellence, and I would like to welcome you to today's offering on Doctoral Perspective Initiatives. This offering was initially presented at the National Faculty Meeting in Tampa, Florida in January of 2019. I do want to call attention to a link that's in the lower left-hand side of the screen, and you may want to click on that now and bookmark it because the presenters will be referring to it later on in the recording. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to our panel, and we'll kick it off with Dr. Deborah Inman. Welcome. Thank you, Lita. Uh, we're very excited to be with you today, and we really appreciate your coming to view this session. As many of you know, we've been focusing a lot of attention on the prospectus stage over the last year. Um, as, as everyone in every program knows, it is at the prospectus stage that many of our students are, are really spending much more time than is needed. So one of the, the real efforts that we've been uh, working with, not only within CRQ, but with RPAC and with with leadership within different programs, and all of the panel members here today in particular, is to really try to understand why students are spending so much time there. We've developed materials working together and collaboratively across programs to help our students have better guidance and understandings of the expectations of the prospectus versus the proposal. Many of you may uh, recall um, a while back, Andy Kermode um, worked with programs who really wanted to be able to use the prospectus, the preliminary section of the prospectus within my DR for, for committee members. And we've had a couple of programs who have done some pilot testing with the use of the preliminary sections, and you'll hear more about that today. But the work that we're presenting today, the information, is continued efforts to, again, improve the student progress. We're really looking for substantive progress at the prospective stage um, and helping students differentiate and faculty differentiate, for that matter, the difference between expectations at the prospective and the proposal stage. And as many of you know, all of our Walden doctoral programs do have a prospectus requirement. And we've really uh, found that by focusing earlier, by providing really solid guidance at this early stage, helping our students to get really very targeted and on track with the prospectus, is improving the transition from the prospectus to the proposal stage. And we've had a real emphasis on trying to make sure that students understand what feasibility is. You know, is their study feasible? Making certain they understand alignment. So these are all very critical issues uh, you'll find with our new materials that Michelle Brown will talk about in just a minute. We do have uh, a prospectus guidebook and a prospectus rubric that will be very, very helpful uh, for the PhD students we have uh, prospectus checklist. So I'm going to turn it over to you now, Michelle, to continue providing information on these exciting new requirements for the PhD program, as well as great information for other programs. We do have some professional docs that have also um, updated their prospectus materials and made those materials available to their students and faculty. Uh, the, all of the requirements for those programs are noted by those programs. So when you go into the program specific information on the CRQ website, you'll see what your program requires. If you have any questions about the requirements at the prospective stage, please do reach out to your program director for any additional clarification. Michelle? Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Deborah. So we're very excited to share these recent prospective stage initiatives with you today. Um, as Deborah mentioned, several items have been updated in the prospectus guidebook for PhD and for several of our professional doctoral programs. Um, there was a slight uh, wording tweak in one of the rubric items of the PhD prospectus rubric, and we'll cover that today. There's new um, site naming or actually site masking information in all guidebooks. There were some updates to the problem statement section to really assist students 
students as they develop their doctoral level problem. There were additional updates made to the guidebook for some instructional information on research design alignment for students, because as we know, that does um, appear to be an area where students could utilize some additional instruction and support. And then the prospective sample document in the PhD and some of our um, professional doctoral program guides have been modified so that there's a separate quantitative and qualitative example, right? So not a mixed method example. Um, and we'll talk more about that shortly. And then, of course, there is, as Deborah mentioned, now a checklist document for PhD and several professional doctoral programs that students can use along, you know, the development of their prospectus. And uh, we will also talk a bit today about that preliminary review stage of the prospectus in task stream. Okay, so in terms of the guidebook, Magdalene, I'm going to turn this over to you to speak a little bit about the alignment pieces that were added in. Okay, thank you very much, Michelle. Um, one of the things we're excited about in the prospectus sure. guidebook is talking about alignment. Alignment is a really important part of the um, entire process, but really starts with the prospectus stage. And one of the things we've added is a self-check for students to ask themselves the questions about their research design. And the questions really focus on, is there a logical progression from the research problem to the purpose of the study? And then looking at, is there an identified framework that grounds the investigation into the state of the problem? And then is there an alignment between the problem, the purpose, and the framework? And do those align with the research questions and the nature of the study? Does the research question address the problem and align with the purpose? And then will the instrument, data source, and analysis address the research question? Along with that, we're also excited to have added some visuals to really help the students and faculty to really be able to look at different ways of visualizing alignment from kind of a funnel method to a more linear um, visualization of alignment and also aligning this with your uh, uh, specific program of study. So not only assuring that alignment goes throughout the uh, prospectus, but also making sure, again, that alignment uh, proceeds through with your program of study as well. So I'm going to turn this over to Carla. OK, thank you very much, Magdalene. The, uh, there are uh, standard section, sections within the guidebook uh, that um, represent the sections that need to be filled out, and one of them is the problem uh, statement section. And within that, uh, the students would be clarifying the social problem versus the research problem and adding notes um, uh, that, that they need in order to make sure that those problems represent the discipline-specific um, uh, outline or, or way to view the problem. So the students would also then make sure that the problem is framed within the uh, primary focus of the, of the discipline of the study. Also, the next section uh, that we looked at uh, when we were reviewing the development of uh, the update for the guidebook was the background section. And within the background section, it had traditionally been a narrative. And uh, what we have all decided uh, as, a, as a group is that the better way of handling that is that students would provide five to 10 peer-reviewed articles most of them should be um, published within the first or in the last five years, and that would be to really explain and um, outline the background of the problem 
instead of uh, providing a, a long narrative uh, related to the background, uh, which was what uh, was happening. There was a mixed, a mixed bag. Some students were doing a narrative, and some were doing the uh, peer-reviewed uh, articles in, in very short, brief annotations. And that is the preferred method of handling the background. In the framework, uh, there, there was uh, also a uh, delineation between making sure that a conceptual framework or a theoretical framework were clearly identified. And typically, in, in most programs, the conceptual framework aligned with a qualitative study where a theoretical framework tended to align with a quantitative study, though it's not exclusive. Uh, however, students would uh, also be using uh, literature from seminal works in order to represent those theoretical perspectives and conceptual um, uh, framework uh, components. In the research question section, um, the students would uh, also need to be including, if they are working with a qualitative study, uh, their hypotheses. Uh, that is uh, something that was, in some cases, evident, in other cases not as evident, uh, depending on uh, uh, which program you were working in. So we chose to standardize that, that if a qualitative or a quantitative study was developed to also include the hypotheses. And nothing new really occurred in the nature of the studies, so that section remains uh, essentially the same. In the next section, this was also uh, in the previous section of um, the original um, prospectus uh, template, and that is the types and possible sources of data. And there are many different types of data. There are primary and secondary. And students that are working with um, primary data would perhaps explain uh, what interviews, you know, that they would be interviewing participants or there would be historical documentation and or records and so forth. And for secondary data or any pre-existing data, the students would be requesting, uh, we would be requesting them to make sure that they also provided uh, the, the source, the data source, where, where they would be getting that uh, data source. The other aspect that is extremely important for students to recognize is that if for any reason that they are going to be dealing with a sensitive topic or a vulnerable population, uh, they need to consult early with IRB. It's a, a high, it, we are recommending that uh, students contact IRB if they do know that they're going to be dealing with a sensitive topic or vulnerable population before or during the process of putting your perspectives together so that you have a clear understanding of what the ethical guidance needs to be and need to incorporate that into your um, in it, making sure that you incorporate that into your study. And then you can find out more information about that actually at the IRB Guides and Frequently Asked Questions page. And the item that was added, uh, we had removed the optional section on potential uh, analytic strategies. But what we did add, and uh, in, from with great agreement across the board, is that students needed to be able to look at the limitations and challenges and or barriers that they needed to account for those aspects uh, in their prospectus in order to really understand whether or not their study had feasibility. And uh, that was a very important uh, aspect for students to consider. And with that, Magdalene? Hey. Um, thank you. So um, in slide um, 13 here, we talk about the, um, the new additions that we have added here to the uh, guidebook, which are um, separate examples of the quantitative and qualitative um, 
uh, uh, prospectus um, examples. And previously, we had used just one example, which was a mixed methods example. And we felt that it was really important for students to have um, a, an example of a quantitative and an example of a qualitative um, prospectus because those are the studies that students do most frequently. And so um, we were happy to really uh, design a, an example that was specific to each. In addition, um, you will find at the, the end of the guidebook um, a quantitative and a qualitative um, historical alignment tool. And that's really designed too to help students uh, be able to look at that tool and determine how those, those tools are helpful for you, whether you're designing a quantitative or a qualitative study, to be able to utilize the tool that's going to fit with your study to be able to move forward um, most expeditiously. So from there, I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle. Thanks, Magdalene. So on this slide now, you're gonna see the updated rubric item. And I just wanna clarify that this was a rubric update in uh, for the PhD prospectus. And so the language that is underlined was added to number seven rubric item, feasible. So now it reads, can a systematic method of inquiry be used to address the problem? And does the approach have the potential to address the problem while considering potential risks and burdens placed on research participants? Again, as the working group was considering um, the added language on limitations and or barriers, et cetera, um, we felt it was very important for students to also um, while considering those potential risks and burdens placed on participants, we wanted that alignment with the rubric standard as well. So we included just that additional um, research ethics piece to rubric item number seven. So who would like to overview the prospectus checklist? Magdalene? I'll go ahead and talk about that, Michelle. Sure. Um, so the prospectus checklist is something that's Thank new you. for the, the um, guidebook. And we're um, very happy to bring this forward. And um, as a team, we felt that it was really important for students to have something that would be an easy to follow tool um, that would help them be able to determine each of the things that would go into the section of the prospectus. Um, we understand that students don't always go back to the prospectus guide um, and, and look at that on a daily basis as they're, they're writing their prospectus. And though we want, want every student to use that as a tool to be able to provide the detail and really be able to give them the um, underpinning of what they need to uh, write their prospectus, we understand that having something that's easier to follow, like a checklist, is really beneficial. And so the prospectus checklist that's been designed is a fillable form for students to be able to utilized to have an easy way to write their, write their prospectus and also to put the page number in there um, for each of the sections that they're writing. Then their chair can go in and easily follow each of the, the areas of the prospectus that they have detailed out, find exactly what page that area of the, the prospectus is in and be able to make comments within the prospectus checklist to follow uh, where each of those items are. They can make comments in there and then the committee member can do the same. So the committee member can follow along and make comments again in that same place. This allows the students, the committee member and the chair to have an ongoing conversation during this iterative process so that, that they can see what each other has, has commented on. They can get back to each other with uh, feedback um, as this process unfolds. So we think that this is going to be a really beneficial tool for the entire um, committee and the student to really make progress 
um, in a shorter time frame for students to move forward and be successful in the prospectus uh, uh, part of the dissertation process. So we're very excited about this moving forward. Okay, and next we're gonna turn it over to Andy. Thanks. Um, so there was a lot of interest from programs um, for a preliminary review section in task stream for the prospectus. And this had not um, been part of the original design of MyDR. So as we're examining the prospectus, we're excited to work with IT and make this available at the same time that we've um, released these other materials for prospectus guidance. This preliminary review stage in task stream will allow an area for the student to submit drafts and receive feedback through the development of their prospectus before the document is ready for a more formal rubric analysis. Um, this preliminary review, it functions like the proposal and final study preliminary development areas. It contains automated email messaging that will go out for all activity that happens within that section. So when the student submits, an email will notify the committee. And then when the committee provides feedback, an email will also go out notifying the student and committee that feedback's been given. The advantage of this in task stream now is that the committee and student do not have to work through sending drafts back and forth through email and possibly you know, some of the feedback getting lost. It also provides um, transparency for the entire committee and new committee members that have been reassigned to the committee. So the nice thing in task stream is it provides an evaluation history. And so for programs like in PhD, some assign the URR after the pr prospectus approval. A URR can then go back and see all of the feedback left originally by the chair and second members um, for the prospectus. And there are a couple different ways in which the preliminary sections are administered within task stream. And for more details on that, you can go to the um, Faculty MyDR resource page. There's also a link to that page um, within the automated email notifications when students do submit work in that area. And so we've also had um, Magdalene and Carla, who are part of this presentation, working within their programs um, to promote um, the, the use of the preliminary stage and they have kind of a unique take on it too where the second member in their programs are using task stream to provide that review where the chair is providing it within the Blackboard classroom. And some other programs are still choosing to um, follow more of that rubric analysis format of a chair member review and a reconciliation. So before we move on to the next slide, um, I'd like to give Carla and Magdalene the opportunity to um, give feedback on how that's been going for their programs and the benefits that they've seen in the use of the preliminary sections. Sure, this is Carla. Um, uh, from the standpoint of a PhD in management program, uh, we've actually em embraced uh, having the uh, prospectus preliminary uh, section, very, it's been very helpful for us. Um, we have a pretty good uh, amount of uh, folks that are, are beginning to really utilize that. And um, we've been uh, taking a look at um, the, the success rates, too, of students that are, are following that, that format. And, and they seem to be going through the process a little bit more quickly, which is the whole intent actually for this whole initiative. So there's a little bit of evidence that the, the prospectus are becoming um, 
more coherent and in, in better shape and, and we're able to track down all of the feedback. So it's been, it's been a very positive thing. Magdalene? Thank you. Yes, um, I would agree with Carla that it's been a very beneficial thing for our students, um, moving them more quickly through the stages. Um, also, you know, as, as Andy commented, it makes it much easier to be able to retrieve the feedback um, rather than sending it through email where it can sometimes get lost. Um, you're not quite sure when you sent it to the committee member. Um, and have to follow up on it with the automated emails, it really makes it a very nice seamless system to be able to have the student submit it in the system. Everything is automated, you know, when it was submitted um, and all of the feedback is recorded within the system. So it's been very beneficial for us in health services as well. So we really appreciate having this. So thank you. Andy, any, any other comments you'd like to add on the preliminary okay. review stage? And this is Carla. No, we're just, yeah, we're excited that it's, um, it's now available for all programs, the, the preliminary review section. And so I would encourage you to um, visit the, the MyDR faculty resource page on the Center for Research Quality's website and also um, talk with your program directors and how um, your program is going to be utilizing the preliminary sections. Thanks, Carla. Okay. All right. So how much is enough? And uh, this was a, a discussion that we had about uh, making sure that the perspective Prospect I are, are at least in the Goldilocks zone, not too much, not too little, and making sure that uh, they followed along with the, the rubric standards. In particular, <clears throat> the problem should have addressed at least six of the uh, rubric standards, such as being able to justify the, the reason for the problem, making sure that it's grounded in literature, that it's an original problem that it's meaningful, of course feasible, and that the individual remains very objective in the way that they address the problem. In addition to this, uh, the most important thing in order to being able to make sure that you have it about the right size is, is to uh, have a very good, close, tight alignment between from section to section, from problem to purpose, from purpose to research question, from research question actually to the conceptual framework and also to the nature of the study. And uh, that alignment is critical in uh, making sure that uh, it is also scoped properly. And then of course the final aspect of, of the prospectus is to make sure that in the significance there is a clear uh, designation of the positive social change, uh, not only for, the, uh, for society perhaps, but it might also be for an organization or group of people. And it may also be that in the significance you would also describe the um, importance to the theory or um, to your discipline. And so these uh, guidelines, making sure that it's not overly long, uh, typically, a well-written uh, prospectus tends to be around 12 pages or so, right around that. And if you were to consider it like an executive summary, that's really what it needs to be. It needs to be concise and direct, and you need to be able to demonstrate that all of the aspects that are necessary in order to really convey your plan to move forward with your study. And so that's really what the Goldilocks principle really centered around. Mag Magdalene and I were looking at um, Prospecti, and we, she sent me one because it had just come across her, her desk, and, and the, the background of the study, or the, actually the problem, was like 37 pages long. And we were kind of like flabbergasted by that because that is, that is, um, that's a lot of writing that uh, could have been 
um, utilized in a different way. Uh, these, again, are brief documents. They're very succinct and very tightly written. Um, so there's not a lot of room for, there shouldn't be a lot of room for excess, at least in these documents, to be able to convey the best possible plan for their um, proposal and then ultimately their dissertation. And um, thank you so much, Carla. Um, I, this is Deborah. I just want to make a clarification. You know, I think that we've provided some very good specific guidance. One thing we want to make certain that anytime you know you hear references to page numbers, those are not requirements. Um, it's just an example of a difference, perhaps between you know what you might look at twelve pages versus thirty seven pages. But that doesn't mean that that um, anyone could should walk away from our session today saying a prospectus should be 12 pages. That's just an example of kind of the difference in showing the variance in the type of uh, prospectus that's actually submitted. So again, it's making certain that we're differentiating between the expectations of the prospectus and the proposal, but we're not providing um, any specific page number requirements. But we're asking you to think about what is needed to meet this your students' need um, for their prospectus in your program and how it differentiates between the expectations of the prospectus and the proposal, keeping in mind all the excellent guidance provided, not only in our presentation today, but also in the new uh, prospectus materials. Yes, I didn't mean to intend that, that it, it should be about 12 pages, but it is more of an executive summary as opposed to a chapter one light. Uh, that, that is uh, something that we have all talked about, that it shouldn't be at that level, um, putting the, in, into the prospectus. So thank you very much for the clarification. And so, um, Magdalene, did you want to uh, talk about that? Well, we kind of talked about this off launch already. Um. Sure, Carla, I'd be happy to. Um, we talked a little bit about the soft launch and the, the preliminary uh, uh, section and task stream. And you know, we can say a little bit more about um, how the, the prospectus guide and the checklist uh, have been working for us um, as we've been using it. Uh, in the, the programs, um, I, I think, you know, some of the things that have been extremely helpful are the explanations on alignment. Um, students have really said that they've appreciated the additional explanations on alignment. Uh, I think students tend to be a bit um, confused at the beginning as they start writing their perspectives about what exactly do you mean by alignment? And can you explain to me a little bit further about what alignment means? Um, and, and sometimes their purpose doesn't really follow um, and align with their, their problem. Um, and, and so these tools have been helpful for them um, in, in what they're, they're reporting back. So I think that's, that's one of the things that has come out of the soft launch. Um, the other thing that has been helpful, and I'm finding this right now as I'm teaching or preparing for the dissertation course, is explaining the difference between the social problem and the research problem. Um, as we've talked as a group, as we've developed the, the prospectus guide um, updates, students, I think, really struggle with what is a social problem and what's a research problem. And, and explaining the difference and, again, helping students over that hurdle of, of, yes, I'm interested in this topic, how does it become a research problem? Or is it a research problem? Or can it be a research problem? Explaining that difference and providing them um, with further explanation, I think, has been helpful. And then, as we mentioned, the checklist um, being a nice go-to to help them understand a little bit further about you know, how they can uh, utilize that, that go-to um, as a follow-through for them. So, Carla, are there things that you would like to add that you found helpful from the, the soft launch? Yes, I, I would say that probably the uh, second item uh, was was the most beneficial, at least at this point. Uh, we hadn't, at the, at the time of the soft launch, 
begun to use the checklist uh, as extensively as we are right now. However, the distinction between the social problem and the research problem was extremely helpful for students and helping them to understand um, you know, how to construct that or how to construct a, a problem statement using that as a, as a springboard to find more uh, focused and uh, detailed discipline-specific problem. I think that that language also has uh, helped a great deal uh, drive students more closely to uh, align with the, um, the program intent. In other words, if it's management, then, then it needs to be management leadership, knowledge management, and things in that domain, as opposed to having students uh, step into other domains that are probably not appropriate uh, for, the, uh, for the program. So, we found that that language, that, that uh, tightening up, really was uh, very beneficial in that. And the visual explanations as well, uh, I think, is uh, going to be um, uh, a big help in that. It, it, the other thing that this does, too, is that it helps to align to the residency a little bit more closely as well. And I think it's um, in residency three, uh, students start to uh, explore using the same vocabulary as social problem and research problem. So this is also a very positive thing. Michelle? Michelle, we'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Carla. OK, thanks. So on the slide right now, you're going to see a heading that says Prospectus Quick Link. And this refers back to the um, the web address or the, the link, the hyperlink, that Lita pointed out at the beginning of the session. It's at the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. And so what we've done in CRQ, we've tried to pull together the pieces that students really need as they're developing their prospectus. And so something you're not seeing on the, the slide right now, but that you will see when you click on that link and go to that web page, is there's also a developing the prospectus video available for students. It was recommended to us, actually, by some of our great faculty. And they recommended having some sort of visual or video piece to kind of go hand in hand as a companion with all of the great guidebooks and checklists that we have. So in addition to that video, we really hope that all students in the prospective stage do take a look at that. It really kind of sets the stage for the development of the prospectus document. So then coupled with that are these quick links, which include um, links to the guidebooks and the checklists and rubrics and, of course, the writing templates from the Writing Center, various writing supports, library support, methodology support, and so on. Um, the second portion of the quick links actually has all of the major headings from the prospectus document and some relevant links to some explanations or some resources related to that heading, things that we believe a student would find very helpful as they are writing their prospectus document, in addition to their guidebook, of course, and in addition to the sample in the guidebook. So we did definitely wanted to call that out so that everyone could um, take a look at those and have that link to share with your students who are in the prospectus stage. Well, that actually brings us to the end of this webinar on doctoral prospectus initiatives. And I want to thank you for viewing. Lita, did you want to close us out? I just want to thank the presenters, the panelists. Thank you so much for presenting this offering. It was very informative. And for the viewers, please don't forget to click on the Prospectus Quick Links tab on the lower left-hand side of the page. You can pause this recording and click on that. And I advise you to bookmark the page for future viewing. Thank you again, and we 